I'm very excited today to welcome Jerry Beck. He is going to talk to us about his new book, The 100 Greatest Looney Tunes. Um, just a little background on Jerry. Um, he's an animation historian and cartoon producer. He's written over 15 books on the subject, including The Animated Movie Guide, Looney Tunes, The Ultimate Visual Guide, and The 50 Greatest Cartoons. And he's also the co-founder, co-writer of the popular animation blog, Cartoon Brew. And Jerry's a former studio executive with Nickelodeon and Disney, and currently a consulting producer to Warner Brothers Universal and Disney for their classic animation DVD compilations. He's also taught animation history at NYU, SVA, the AFI, and UCLA. So please join me in welcoming Jerry Beck. Thank you. Um, okay, well this is a first for me actually. I haven't really gone out talking about uh, this particular book, but um, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, I guess what I'm gonna do is uh, tell you a little bit about how I got into cartoons, and I'm also gonna read a little bit from the introduction that I wrote and, and hopefully we'll have time to look at a couple of clips. I, I guess everybody thought they would be coming to lunch and seeing some cartoons today and that kind of thing, but uh, we'll do our best to try to sneak some clips in. Um, I, am, I, when I was a kid, I really, I watched cartoons on TV and actually I never laughed. I remember not laughing at cartoons. I never thought they were funny. It was only later when I did laugh at them that I realized I had never laughed at them before. I just took what was going on on the screen as real. You know, it was just things that I'm supposed to watch. And somewhere in my teenage years, I used to come home from school around three o'clock and my local, I was in from New York and the local station was running uh, Bugs Bunny and Casper cartoons at like three o'clock and I would just come home, I'd flip the TV on, I'd do some other stuff. And I started to notice how great these Looney Tunes were. Uh, not only they were better than those Casper cartoons, A, but B, they were actually funny. I was laughing at them. And uh, I also started to notice the artistry. I was like a kid who always wanted to draw comic books and drew comics in school. And how did they make those things move? And, and, and what is the story on these cartoons? They're hilarious. I got could, I knew about Mel Blanc from the credits. I slowly began to notice the names of the directors. And one day, one fateful Saturday morning, um, I turned on, uh, after watching a lot of these cartoons, I turned on Saturday morning's Bugs Bunny show, and it was already started. And a cartoon was on. It was that one with, uh, not happy birthday, not happy birthday. Does anybody know that one? <laughs> it's the one. It's a. It's it's one where a cat's versus a, a dog, and there's penalties. And uh, the cat character always is every time that he gets caught, he screams something like, you know, not the bridge, not the bridge. And then they do some crazy uh, punishment that had something to do with a bridge. And uh, I had seen that cartoon before, and here it was again. And I realized, okay, what's the name of this cartoon? I needed to know. You know, I, I want to know where can I go to look for that? And there was no Google then. There was no internet then. There was no books on the subject of Looney Tunes. I mean, really, this was in the 70s, and it was pretty uh, isolated out there. There were a couple of books on Disney, and that's about it. Even those weren't like thorough reference books. And how could anybody find out the name of this thing unless I have to watch all these cartoons again in rotation? You know, maybe six months from now, they might rerun it, and I'd have to have written down the title. Well, that's exactly what I did. I started writing down the titles. And I started to research these cartoons more thoroughly. I needed to know everything about them. And that led me to, um, uh, in my case, and being in New York, I, I, uh, and this is the 70s, but I, I uh, ended up finding out there was a college class. This was after I had gotten out of high school, and I was going to the School of Visual Arts in New York to be an animator. That was my, my goal. But I found out there was a class being taught at the new school by a, a guy that... Um, uh, an, an author named Leonard Malton. And uh, Leonard had just did, did a book on the Disney films and had his movie guide, his first movie guide had just come out and was doing a class on animated cartoons. And I said, I have to meet this guy and I have to, I have to uh, take this class. And I ended up meeting him and we ended up becoming great friends and colleagues throughout this time. And I ended up helping him on a book called Of Mice and Magic which came out in 1980. And that was really the first big history book of all the American animated cartoon studios. And doing the research for about three or four years, 
immersed me. Yeah, I was his research associate. I get kind of a credit like that on the front page. But I, uh, it immersed me into the world of the Hollywood cartoon and who the players were and what the films were and what the studios did and which cartoons came out from which place. And it was, it was, and it's, and I thought when we did that book and it came out in 1980 that that would be, that was it. We, 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 we researched it and we published a book and it's all in here and there's nothing else to do. And here I am, how many years later? 30 years later or something? And, uh, and uh, I have a blog where we publish new information every single day about uh, the history of animation. And in our blog, we do uh, history and we do what's going on today and hopefully what's happening in the future. But uh, in doing it, I never thought I'd be able to, I, I didn't intend to write, <laughs> make a career of writing books about Looney Tunes, but it just sort of ended up that way. After Of Mice and Magic, I did a more thorough book that listed all the 1001 Looney Tunes cartoons with all the credits and plot synopsis and all that stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and beyond that, I was then asked by Warner Brothers to actually help me, help them uh, put together some other books. We did, I did one on Tweety and Sylvester and uh, one that was like a, a visual guide to, the, to all the characters. And about, about 15 years ago, about 1994, um, I was talking to a publisher and I, we had this brainstorm about doing a book called The 50 Greatest Cartoons. And, uh, and we did it. And this is, again, before the internet and before Google and before blogs and all that stuff. And so what we did was we sent out surveys, printed surveys to, I think, five, I think it was 5,000 uh, anybody. 5,000 people in animation societies, animators, schools, film critics, writers, anyone we knew who should know, people around the world, we got back about a thousand. And that's normal, you know, you get back about a thousand. And we did a consensus of that, and uh, we did a book called The 50 Greatest Cartoons. And in that book, about half of those cartoons were Warner Brothers cartoons. And, uh, and, it, and that book came out, and it was, it, it, was, it was a big deal the year it came out. It was actually quite popular and uh, sold out a lot of the uh, a lot of animation schools use it as a reference and all that, and actually regular schools and they uh, and it went out of print. It was published by Turner Publishing and it went out of print. Uh, that company went out of business uh, when Turner got rid of things like that, and um, it's been in limbo. And luckily now, because of the internet with uh, Amazon and eBay and things like that, you can actually buy a copy of it if you if you want to. But it was really hard to find it for years and years and years. And I, thought to myself, I really want to do that book again. I want to do it over again, because now there's more films, and there's more things to think about. And uh, long story short, I, uh, this publisher um, in, in, in San Francisco uh, that did this new book uh, called me up, and they just, they had, they'd just gotten a, a license. They decided to license Looney Tunes from Warner Brothers. And uh, they asked me if I had any ideas for, for a new book. And I, I said, you know what, I'd love to do my book, The 50 Greatest Cartoons, again, but maybe we can adapt it to Looney Tunes, since so many of those were in there. And I learned one lesson from that previous book, make it 100, because 50 is not enough. And, and, and 100 is not enough when it comes to Looney Tunes. Um, there, you know, uh, there's, there's pro there are 1,000, there's probably, honestly, there's possibly 50% of that uh, maybe maybe a little less than 50, but maybe 40% that honestly are not great cartoons. You know, there's a lot of them that were made in the in the 60s when the budgets were very low, and in the 30s when they hadn't reached uh, gotten to the style that we know of. You know, the uh, the the and before Chuck Jones and Tex Avery, the great animators uh, got there. So you can kind of get r to, to dismiss a lot of those, although I like a lot of them. Um, and then you, st you still have hundreds that are really good. And uh, so what I say in this book at the beginning in the introduction is that we're probably going to disappoint some people by not by, by what's in here, by what, what's not in here, the ones we couldn't, uh, that wouldn't fit into uh, the 100. And um, I'm going to read just a notch from the beginning of my uh, intro uh, because it really is what I feel about these cartoons. I say... No doubt about it, the Looney Tunes are the funniest cartoons ever made. In fact, I'll take that statement a bit further. I believe the Warner Brothers cartoons are as classic as anything in American cinema and should be ranked along, alongside the likes of The Wizard of Oz, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, and Citizen Kane. And I really believe that. I mean, when I, when I, I deal with Warner Brothers as a consultant, 
and uh, the people I deal with there are, are great, the people at Warner Home Video. Um, uh, they get it. That's why we were able to do, I was involved with their Looney Tunes Golden Collection DVDs that came out. And if you have that, if you've seen those, you know that they're really, really good. And you, so that means that the people there really get it. But, but there is an attitude at Warner's on, a, on other levels that, that this is just old kids stuff. You know, this is why right now, right at this moment, they're not on TV. They're nowhere to be seen. The only place you can actually watch them outside of, of the, well, they're not on anywhere. They're only on DVD. And, uh, and if you can possibly find some of them on YouTube, and I say that because Warner's is pretty good about going in and getting rid of them if they're on YouTube. But basically, they're nowhere to be seen. And when, I, when we grew up, everybody in this room, they were actually on several different channels. They were on the Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon. They were on the, the, the Warner Brothers, the WB. Uh, they were on uh, ABC Saturday Morning. They were all, they were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. And uh, we all grew up with them. And right now, there's... Uh, uh, and th that's been that way for, again, 40 years or more. Uh, uh, only in the last five, they've been completely gone. And uh, uh, so I, when somebody just told me a moment ago the first, the first DVD that they bought for their, their kid, I think that's how you put it, was, was, uh, was, was one of the Looney Tunes sets. I said, good dad. You know, that definitely we have to uh, spread the word. I feel like I'm a preacher preaching the gospel right now. Um, as I write here, uh, we're... True, we're talking about seven-minute cartoons, humorous drawings made with, pen, with pen, ink and paint that usually featured talking animals in impossible, hilarious situations. But the Warner Brothers cartoons created, as do all great films, original characters with believable personalities and motivations. Who doesn't, who doesn't know someone like Heffy Duck? Who doesn't sometimes feel like Wile E. Coyote? Who doesn't want to be Bugs Bunny? The cartoons themselves are miniature works of art that often mix sophisticated filmmaking techniques and brilliant artwork with witty dialogue and hysterical situations. It should be noted that despite the popular misconception, cartoon, these cartoons were never aimed exclusively for kids. In fact, the filmmakers claim to have made them for themselves. Because of their technical brilliance and sharp-eyed humor, the Looney Tunes have stood the test of time. They've, they've become permanent fixtures in global pop culture, and, and as with all fine art, can be enjoyed again and again, touching us with something new upon each viewing. Um, anyway, I'd like to just, uh, what I'll do right now is, uh, I will show some clips. And if you have any questions about the history of Looney Tunes, um, or anything else I'm involved with, uh, anything to do with the world of animation, I'm happy to answer that. So how's the condition of the, all of the materials over at Warner Brothers? I mean, there was a lot of times that people considered that the cartoons would have just had their short life and then that would be it, but now we're yeah. restoring and, yeah. and putting everything together. And how do you feel about the, the difference in, uh, given how involved you are with, with classic cartoons for all the studios, about uh, cleaning the elements to the point where none of the flaws are visible. I mean, Disney's three issues right now are, are pristine, and there's a question of right. is the film grain, is the way that it looks from a theatrical experience the art, or is it the, uh, the animation itself? Where do you stand on all of this, and what do you know about uh, the state of our elements right now. Wow, that's a great question. I'm happy to answer it. I hope it doesn't bore anybody because I usually get the trivia questions or something about Looney Tunes. So great. Um, this is my subject. Um, I look at the glass half full. There's a lot of uh, the, the elements ex outside of Disney, um, outside of the Disney company, they always preserved all their films really well for the most part. Um, and then they, they, they almost overdo it when they do their, their restorations. I'm not crazy about that. Some of the super recent ones they put out, like Pinocchio, I think they did a good, really good job. But some of the, some of the earlier versions of uh, Bambi that I've seen, Peter Pan, um, Snow White that are coming to mind, they're cleaned up to a ridiculous degree that it almost looks artificial. It doesn't look real. It doesn't look, it looks strange for some reason. It's clean, but it looks, doesn't look right. I don't understand that. I don't understand why I feel that way or why it is. Um, uh, I think they just overdid it. So I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who, who thinks you sh it should be an honest transfer, you know, where you, where you can still see that it was, uh, th there's chemical mistakes that were made, you know, in the lab on one frame, you could kind of leave it, you know, you don't have to really clean every little speck up. Um, there's, there's unfortunately, 
there's the other end of the spectrum. There's a, there's a cleanup process that exists called DVNR, you know, which is a vi di digital video cleanup removal, whatever. It's, it's a, and what it does is it takes out, uh, if they're restoring a live action film and they're putting it through the digital cleanup, if there's a bit of dirt on one frame, it'll take the dirt out and replace it with you know, the image or the color, fine. But when you do that with animation, with animation is frame by frame. There could be a different drawing on every frame. So it reads this it reads the drawings as as dirt and it eliminates the outline. This is a weird thing, and there are videos out there that you could see this on. So it just it suddenly the characters are moving, they have no they don't have that outline that they have. Now this is on isn't on any of the Looney Tunes sets, but there's there's definitely some th examples in the past where that this has happened and it's something that People like me have to go in there and say, don't use that cleanup system. I'm very proud of the Popeye. I don't want to get off subject, but Popeye, we did Popeye for um, a Warner Home Video, and we restored those, those fantastic Fleischer cartoons. They're classics, and the highlights of those sets are these uh, two reelers, these Technicolor, you know, Popeye meets Sinbad, Popeye meets Aladdin, and if you've seen them before on public domain videos or anywhere else, you haven't seen them the way they look on this DVD set. They look like they're jaw dropping. They're in restored Technicolor with 3D backgrounds and uh, it's just gorgeous with the original titles back on. But see Paramount Pictures Presents and all that. One of my big uh, campaigns for 20 years now, and I'm still not done, it hasn't happened yet, is the Bugs Bunny Show. In 1960, on ABC TV, there was a series called The Bugs Bunny Show that lasted two years. And it's something like 56 episodes, maybe there's more than that. And it was uh, basically, uh, it was brand new footage that they, they animated with Mel Blanc doing the voices of Bugs Bunny coming out on stage. You've all seen the opening because they use that opening over and over again for Saturday morning where they march out on stage. That was part of the original opening of this show. And um, they, they had the characters come out and they'd be on stage and they'd be talking and it would go into a, an old cartoon. And there'd be three old cartoons and this bridging material in between. Well, this show never was syndicated. It was only after it went off the network on, in 1962, it was then put on Saturday Morning Network. And it stayed on Saturday Morning Network technically, becoming diff under various names, you know, Bugs Bunny Show, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Show, the, you know, the Bugs Bunny's Tweety Show, whatever. It stayed on network Saturday morning for like 30 years. So, it, so the original show, the original version, which was a half hour, was never syndicated. Uh, the, you've never seen it. I mean, it's never been rerun the way it was originally shown. We, we tried on some of these DVD Golden Collections to restore a couple of episodes. When they, when they, when they, when they uh, uh, put it, kept it going on Saturday morning throughout the years, they just chopped up the original negatives. Every year they would just chop them and slice them and dice them. And the, so the original materials were kind of gone. They were just, just chopped up. And uh, we could only find black and white uh, prints of some of those episodes. So on the Looney Tunes Golden Collection DVDs that I was involved with, we, we usually put one per, per volume. We, we tried to restore in a Frankenstein way where it goes from black and white to color to black and white. We tried to give you an idea of what this show was like. It's one of the great unrestored things still at Warner's. And every year, every meeting I have with them, I bring it up. It's something that we want to do. It just costs so much money to do it. and. Um, we're, we don't know how we're going to do it. We don't know if there, we, we suspect there might be uh, original negatives in Europe. We may have to colorize the black and white parts. There's all these aspects to having how you would actually restore this show, but it's a real crime that that doesn't exist, and it's, I can go on and on. So do we have any other questions that are a little easier? I, oh. There doesn't seem to be any Tweety Bird cartoons in this book. Oh, there are. There, there are. are. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find one for you. I and think, um, I don't know, is Tweety Pie not there? The list is in alphabetical order. So. And also, like, I just, I've always um, liked Looney Tunes because it's yeah. edgy. Like, it, it's like a, it has violence, it has cross dressing, and it has, like, all these crazy <laughs> things in there. And Disney was always, like, too goody two shoes. <laughs> Very right. goody two shoes. And was it, like, did the creators, was that, like, a specific response to uh, the Disney cartoons? Uh, yeah, actually, it, it is. Um, well, first of all, I want to answer that. Birds Anonymous, and I think there's more than one, but Birds Anonymous, which is uh, doesn't have a picture of Tweety in the uh, in the uh, uh, 
on that first page of the uh, thing. That's a Tweety cartoon. That was an Oscar-winning Tweety cartoon. And I think there might be another one. Uh, yes. Um, in the mid-30s, late 30s, when uh, Tex Avery, a uh, young cartoonist who was just uh, loaded with ideas on what, what you could do in, in animated cartoons, um, got hired by Warner Brothers as a director. Uh, and he uh, started, they started a unit with, with Bob Clampett and Chuck Jones, and, and also Frank Tashlin, another young cartoonist, who, an animator who also joined the studio at that time. Um, had a completely different mindset about what these animated cartoons should be. And luckily, their producer, Leon Schlesinger, uh, at that time, uh, really didn't care. He said, go for it. As long as it's funny, you know, that's what, that's what people seem to expect from cartoons. Make them funny. And their attitude was, uh, everybody was following Disney. It's kind of like today. It's not that much different today with all the animation that's out there. Pixar is really the leader. You know, they're, they're doing innovative stuff every single year. Every single time in DreamWorks and uh, Blue Sky and all the studios that are out there from all the other uh, movie studios are trying to keep up, in, you know, with with Pixar. They're not even trying to. A lot of them aren't trying to do anything different, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think Sony is actually. Sony's trying to do some funny stuff, it seems to me. But but every, everybody's just trying to keep up with Pixar. Pixar's leader. Just trying to do family, trying right. To no right. Exactly. It is. Same story again and again. Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's eye popping. So what? The story is not epic. Yeah, yeah. Did you see Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? I really like that film. That's a good one. Check that one out. Everybody here has seen shaking their heads. Good, good one. Um, the, uh, um, but that's what, that was what was happening in the 30s. Disney was the leader in the shorts, winning all the Oscars. Their shorts were just miles ahead. You look at a, a 1935 Disney cartoon short versus a 1935 Warner Brothers, Paramount, or any other studio short subject, they were literally three or four years ahead of them. It was just ahead of the pack. And then Disney announces they're doing a feature. They're going to do a They're going to break through, and they're going to do Snow White. Snow White comes out, and it was a, it was the avatar of its day. It was the sensation of its day. And um, and the other studios were like, and literally, there, there's articles uh, in my research. There's articles in all the trade magazines uh, where they interview the other studios and whether they're going to make features or not to follow Disney. And Paramount was the only one that did it with with Gulliver's Travels. Uh, the other ones, uh, some of them said they were, and they ended up not doing it. The other ones were shaking their heads. We don't, we don't know. We're not doing that. Warner's said we're sticking the shorts, and we're going to make the funniest shorts that you that you have. It was really an agenda there to do that, and um, and and that's what they did. You're right. Disney wasn't really doing funny. They had actually by the by the late '30s abandoned it. They were doing they, by then they were doing really fairy tales and stories. If you really look at their shorts, they're, they're even, even the Mickey Mouse shorts, which have gags in them, are story driven. You know, like like the one where he's the brave little tailor. You know, um, and he's this one where he goes through the looking glass. You know, they're very very story driven. And and then the Silly Symphony series they were doing was also, of course, fairy tales. And a lot of other competitors said, well, we'll follow Disney in doing fairy tales. And then you get a lot of again, in the late '30s, just happy harmonies and color rhapsodies these are the names of the other other cartoons from the other studios they just started copying disney in, in, in a different way warners uh just uh decided let's break the fourth wall let's be the marx brothers of the cartoon world and let's let's expand that i mean that's that's that was the thinking and that's what they and that's what they really ended up doing and it really in the years from 35 to 40, they're, they're, you could see the experimentation happening, and they're growing cartoon by cartoon. And by the time we hit 1940, and we hit Bugs Bunny, and by the way, yesterday was Bugs Bunny, as Bugs Bunny's what 70th birthday. Uh, it was his, literally the, the the day of his release was yesterday of the first of the one that's considered the first Bugs Bunny cartoon. First time he said, "What's up? Well, what's up, Doc?" A wild hair came out July 27, 1940, and. Uh, that's really the beginning right there with that cartoon. We're hitting the Warner Brothers we all know. The one, the, 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 for the next 20 years, they're making these. They, they've got it down, and, uh, and, and they're running with the ball. And what was great was they had the facility of the Warner Brothers studio, the music 
uh, of the Warner Brothers studio. They had the outlet of, of, of the movie theaters to make these films for. And really, unlike today, they didn't have executive interference. There was nobody in the front office telling them uh, how to make these cartoons or make more of these or make, they, they didn't, maybe they said make more Bugs Bunnies, you know, maybe that, you know, or Tasmanian Devil's pop, popular, make some more with that. Uh, but that's about it. They got, they got, they, they were able to make them for themselves. What they thought was was funny. People ask me all the time. Here's the big question. People ask me all the time, how come they can't make them anymore like that? Even when they try, you know, at Warner Brothers, why can't, why aren't they, can't they do that? How come they can't be captured? They can't. And you know why? It's the same. I've come to this conclusion. It's the same thing. Like um, trying to pick analogies, like the Beatles. Or I like Marvel Comics of the 60s. You know, Marvel Comics of the 60s, if you know that, or the Beatles. These were specific people, you know, uh, the, the four Beatles, uh, it, and Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Gene Colan and Steve Ditko. Certain people uh, at that specific time in that place, you know, uh, you know making, you know, these particular things. I... I I think that's the thing. It, it, was, it was those people. It was Mel Blanc's voices. It was Chuck Jones. It was Frizz Freeling. It was Carl Stallings' music. You know, it was the sound effects. It was just those particular people at that particular time at that particular place made equaled making these cartoons this great. And it's really hard for uh, the newer generation to do it. I, I prefer when I talk to younger people. Don't don't do it make new stuff, do cool new things. There's so many new things that can be done or move forward. I think if somehow they were able to retain their eternal youth of, the, uh, uh, of their, their ages of the, in, the, in the 40s and 50s and were to continue into the 60s and 70s and 80s, they would still have evolved. The cartoons, you know, when people say, you know, Bugs Bunny wouldn't do this or do that, I don't know because when you look at the early Bugs Bunnies, you look at the late ones, the character evolved. That's true of Daffy Duck and all of them. They all sort of changed by the late 50s, and yet they're still good. They're still funny. They may even be funnier. You know, the character of Daffy Duck is hilarious by the late 50s, you know, when he's that, he's that egotistical foil for, for, for uh, Bugs Bunny. You know, that's a great character. That wasn't the character that they originally started with, but they, that happened with all of them. So uh, um, anyway, that's, that's my answer to that question. We had some more questions here. I just wanted to check if anybody over the VC had a question. Mountain View, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Oh, hi. I'm probably about the same age as you are. And what I'm afraid of is that with Disney pushing back the copyright deadline, the fact is that we'll never live to see this content released to the public. And I'm wondering if you have the same fears. <clears throat> well, I have the same uh, fears, I wouldn't call it. I guess I'm an optimist. But I, 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 uh, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not a big fan of this extension of, of copyright. Um, you know, at, at Warner's, they're very protective of it. I, I actually go into meetings with them and... and uh, uh, they're aware, you know, they're, they're aware they want, they, they actually want the stuff out there so that, that, that others won't bootleg it and that, and that sort of thing. And if, as long as a company makes the material accessible, I personally have no problem with them owning it. That's my thing. And on the other hand, we have companies like, uh, I don't want to name names, but I guess I will because I'll happily call them out, um, uh, Sony. Sony Pictures right now, they own Mr. Magoo. Uh, Viacom has Betty Boop and uh, Mighty Mouse. They, they, they have tons of these cartoons that are nowhere to be seen. There's some, you'll go out and say, well, I just got a DVD of Betty Boop. Yeah, there's, a, there's literally a handful of public domain ones that people put out. But there's like 105 Betty Boop cartoons, and they're, they're beautiful, and they should be restored. They should do what Warners has done. With, and Disney has done with restoring their, their I, I have to give credit to Disney except for Song of the South. I don't think there's a, I'm sure there's somebody who could name one or something later, but I don't think there's any of their uh, shorts, uh, there might be a few, but there, there aren't any of their shorts they haven't put out and, and features. They put everything out immaculately restored. Uh, and, and, on the, and on the short side, they've put out a fantastic set I highly recommend you finding called uh, On the Home Front, which is a wartime cartoons featuring De Fuhrer's face, which is Donald Duck uh, dreaming he's a Nazi. These are cartoons they had suppressed for 50 years. There's a whole bunch of cartoons on there that are things they did not want to let out, a la Song of the South, 
uh, that are on there, but uh, they've put all of those things out now, and I give them credit for that. I don't like this copyright extension thing. Um, it's ridiculous, and I just I, I I guess I do have the fear that it will happen again in 25 years, but. Um, I just hope that the, if the cartoons are accessible, and I think that's what's great about the internet, and uh, is that is that at least there's they realize there's some kind of revenue stream, and they can put them out digitally and put them on Hulu or whatever, and and make them available and hopefully make some money as long as they make them accessible. That's all I care about, personally. Stop. stop what? What making Warner Brothers cartoons? Back in the old days. Yeah, they stopped several times. They, the, main, the first time was mainly uh, 1962 was the big, big stop, and mainly it was because there was the perception that that uh, they weren't really making much money by renting them the movie theaters for five dollars. That's actually what they five or ten dollars was all it cost a movie theater, one movie theater, to play a cartoon for a week, you know, and that that market was disappearing in the 60s, so they. Um, uh, basically, they didn't see the, the return of their investment. They, again, it was kind of old school thinking. They were thinking just theatrically, and they weren't really factoring in the future in television. But still, they uh, so they closed the studio down. They, um, if everybody remembers that movie, The Incredible Mr. Limpet, that was the last thing that was done by the the old Warner Brothers cartoon studio. They they stopped making shorts. They st they made that feature, the animation for that, and they uh, and then and then they closed the doors. And um, and then it's it's been open and closed all throughout the years. There's they they've done some other cartoons since, but uh, they've always kept the kind of a departments. In in some years, that department was one person, who was who was who was literally there, an editor who would just edit the Saturday morning uh, Bugs Bunny show, and that was the one employee of the Warner Brothers. So it kind of always existed, even even there was nobody really working there. Strange. Yes. Do you think there's still a market for the uh, for new cartoons in this format, a la you know, kind of like short Looney Tunes, you know, slapstick kind of style, or maybe even not slapstick, but just like that particular format? Because we really don't see that. No, I mean, and yes and no. I mean, on the one hand, uh, one of the most popular things on the internet is short animation. You know, uh, that that's and it's being used on. Uh, Mobile media and uh, all sorts of things. I mean, so short. There, there is a there is a market for people doing shorts more than ever. You know, more more than ever these days. It's a great way to be seen uh, or get your name known for, if you create the next great internet sensation. Um, Warner Brothers. Uh, uh, well, Pixar is of course uh, doing shorts, which they put with their with their feature films, and they do it to develop talent at the studio. And they have all kinds of reasons to try experimental things with the shorts. And it's, that's exactly what Disney did back in the 30s with his Silly Symphonies. That's exactly what those were. Uh, Warner Brothers, for whatever reason, they've, in fits and starts, has been doing this for about 10, 15 years now. They had Chuck Jones doing some shorts at the end of his life that they occasionally showed with a film. Uh, and right now, they've revitalized their little animation division that does mainly TV cartoons like the Batman animated series, you know, Brave and the Bold. And, um, and as part of that, they commissioned uh, an animator in, the, in, the, in that unit to work on three, three minute long uh, Roadrunner cartoons. And uh, the first of which is going to be released this week with a movie that I don't want to see called Cats and Dogs, uh, whatever, the Cats and Dogs 2. Um, and uh, but they're going to they're going to release uh, <clears throat> one of these Roadrunner shorts with the next three family films they put out. Uh, I think the Yogi Bear film at the end of the year will have one as well. And um, and I see, I've seen them and they're in three D. They're Roadrunner and they're very well done. They 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 don't violate or hurt the memory of the classic character. They're they are perfectly in league with it. Uh, they actually use the space of three D. I, I actually think it's kind of brilliant in retrospect. I don't think they even thought about it that the this, the whole desert settings and the up top of mountains, it really works in 3D. And they also have the characters reach out into the screen, which nobody seems to want to do anymore with 3D. So they're really, it's, it really, they're only three minutes, and it's just the ch it's just like three gags in a regular road on a cartoon, but they're really great. And the th explosions in 3D, when the coyote gets blown up in the stereo three-dimensional explosions, it actually it's funnier. The, the, the bigger, you know, they're, they're just bigger explosions. So. It, it, it actually makes it funny again. Any other questions before we have to go back to work? 
Oh, they left. They left. They're gone. They probably had to give up the room at one. All right. Well, we don't have to do that down no, here in Southern good. California. Anyone else has another we question? Have, we have one last one. Just a minor question about, I remember one, I remember a lot of cartoons, of course, don't know the names. Sorry. So, so this is so the people on VC can hear my question. <laughs> oh, okay. Just kidding. Um, so I remember one cartoon in particular where it was Daffy Duck and it was the animator and he's erasing him and oh, yeah. different Duck things. Oh, yeah. Duck Amuck. That's in the book. Duck Amuck. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a copy of the book. I was just curious what the name of that was. But, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm, I can't say I'm a hundred percent expert on, on every title, you know, but uh, the Roadrunners are really hard because uh, the titles really don't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. so, since we're playing Name That Cartoon. Yes. Um, I seem to remember a Wizzy. cartoon where Roadrunner, I think it was Roadrunner had to take a day off and Bugs Bunny oh, yeah. took over. Yeah. And I've never been able to find yeah. anybody even remembering that. It's, oh, they actually. But, they, but that did happen, right? And I think yeah, Speedy Gonzalez I think, shows up I think that one, that one's actually one of the, that's a really sad one to me because that, that doesn't work. It's like a good idea, but it didn't work as a cartoon. It was, so Bugs Bunny is like the roadrunner in that cartoon, right? Yeah, it's standard. It's weird. I think it's called, I'd have to get my other book, my other, my big guide with every title, but I think it's called Compressed Hair. You can look that one up on the internet. I think that's the name of it. It's, it's. No, it isn't. It's pretty. It's one of those ones that's the one I, the one, my worst, my least favorite Bugs Bunny cartoon is uh, one called Prehysterical Hair. It's it's so bad. It's 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 one where he, uh, I don't even remember the exact plot, but it, they're looking at films of prehistoric man, Bugs Bunny is, I guess, and 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 he sees Elmer Fudstone versus a Neanderthal Bugs Bunny. And this is the first cartoon where the, the, the guy, Arthur Q. Bryan, who was the voice of Elmer Fudd, had just died. So they got in somebody else to do the voice, and the voice is, like, pathetic. It's like, Bugs Bunny. It's, it's really bad. And Bugs Bunny is like a Neanderthal, so they drew him a strange way. It's ugly looking. It's got the wrong voice for Elmer Fudd. It's, it's a Robert McKimson. It's a very late one. It's like, hey, this is, like, like, to me, the worst Bugs Bunny cartoon, you, in case you were wondering. What's that? The last... Yeah, they were. They kind of knew it was over at sort of toward the end there. But uh, it's, on it's which one? Compre compressed hair. Is that the one with the, uh, the Bugs Bunny, Bug Bunny and, and, and Wile E. Coyote? Yeah, my fa one of my absolute favorite Bugs Bunnies, and I have too many to. I have, if I think about them, one of my super favorites that's in here is uh, Wile E. Coyote Super Genius, which is called Operation Rabbit. Yeah, Operation Rabbit. That's really a funny, funny cartoon in every every shot. And uh, ah, I can go on and on. All right, one so, buy my book. One more name that cartoon is okay. Uh, one more. Um, Bugs Bunny, and he was in some type of Roman Coliseum or something. Yeah, I think that one's Roman Legion hair offhand. I think Roman that's the name Legion of it. Hair. Yeah. There's one point where he says, "How now, brown cow?" and that's all I remember. I think that's that one. Okay. <laughs> that one's too. That one's a little easy. This is the kind of class I hope to teach someday, where just people ask me, what's the name of the one with? And I get to, okay. <laughs> John and Mary? Oh, that's a gag in a cartoon. There's a cartoon that, that isn't it, but there was one called Wild Wife. Which you should check, which is a, a really good one, but I don't think that's I don't think that's it, but that's one that features two human characters, and it's all about it's all about from a woman's point of view about what a hectic day she has while he's out at, at work, and she just explains it's all about her talking about her day. It's a very odd cartoon with human characters in it anyway, and I think they're called John and Mary. It's called Wild Wife. That's actually one of my I, I like that one just for the oddness of it. <laughs> I'm pro. <laughs> It's very hard to find one that I don't like. I've mentioned one already, but uh, most of these I, I really love. Cool. Well, Jerry will sign books if you'd oh. like to. And yeah. I have another box of books that's being held up by FedEx. So if you didn't get a book, make sure I get your name, and I will get you a book. So thanks very much, Jerry. Thank you. Coming. Thank you.